Learning Block 1, Demand Planning. Supply chain management is about balancing supply with demand. Now you may have taken an econ class that talked about these concepts, or perhaps you've heard it in the news. But the concept of supply and demand is the relationship between how much of a commodity product or service that's available and the desire that buyers have for it. So if you think about the car market right now, the product is cars uh, and we have a limited supply for a variety of reasons right now, but there is a high desire by buyers to obtain a car. And because of that current supply and demand in the car market, it's causing car prices to be higher than we would normally expect. Now, in each learning block, there are going to be a set of learning objectives. Um, here you'll see they're listed here. We will cover them as we go through the content when you're reading or watching these videos or as we talk about it in class. Uh, I will bold and try to emphasize the vocabulary that you want to make note of as you take your Cornell notes of all the content. One good tip is when reviewing your notes, make sure that these um, bolded concepts appear somewhere in your notes and that you feel comfortable explaining them or understanding what they mean. Supply chains are the flow of materials, information, and finances as they move in all directions from multiple players. And these players include suppliers, manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers, and eventually the consumer like us. Now, because of the different players involved and the different kinds of materials, information, and finances, supply chains can be quite complex. The visual you see here is the integrated business management that occurs, and it has multiple components in it. So you can see here is the business plan, which is based on a company's strategies, mission, and vision. So if you're ever curious about a company that you might want to work for, you can go to their website to look up this kind of information. Now this business plan helps to drive the demand plan and the supply plan, where the supply plan helps to deliver the targeted revenue, profitability, and cash flow objectives. The demand plan allows us to understand the forecasting and customer orders, and there are different strategies and activities that we can do to adjust that plan. Something to keep in mind is that customer demand is the key driver of the supply chain. Even though it appears that we're at the end, it's really our needs and wants that helps to drive all of the activities that occur throughout the supply chain. Balancing supply and demand is a constant process. When there's too much demand and not enough supply, there's a business loss that might not be recaptured. That might be because people end up finding alternatives or their needs change over time. Whereas if there is low demand and high supply, that means we have money tied up in inventory and storage facilities. We have too much and nobody wants it. And the risk with that is that our product could become obsolete. On the left here is a visual example of the too much demand and low supply when it comes to baby formula. There are multiple factors that are impacting the low supply, which is making it really hard for families to find the baby formula they need to meet their demand. Whereas on the right side here, Think about the pandemic when there was lockdowns and everyone was at home. There was a shift in the kinds of clothes that we were buying. People started buying more comfortable things to wear at home as opposed to jeans. And as we know with fashion, certain fashion items can become obsolete. And so the risk that we have here is we have too much product that nobody wants to buy. When trying to balance supply and demand, there's an internal method and an external method. When we say internal, think inside, and that's how a company is able to decide how much to make and how much inventory to store or save up. So for instance, in big manufacturing companies, companies that make things, they may have equipment that allows them to easily change what they are producing and in what quantities. This allows them to be flexible and not create waste, also known as lean manufacturing. 
When we say external method, think outside, this is where companies can adjust their pricing and their lead times, which then shapes the demand. The lead time is the time that passes from when you place an order to when you receive your order or the goods from that order. In adjusting the price and or lead time, companies are trying to influence demand to match supply. This is known as demand shaping. An example of modifying the price could be selling 27 inch monitors at the same price as their smaller 24 inch monitors. That can create more demand in our consumers to then buy those 27 inch monitors. Why not get the bigger monitor for the same price, right? In terms of lead time, if you've ever ordered something online, it sometimes will tell you how long it'll take to receive the product. So in this case, they could say, hey, it's gonna take five to seven business days to get the 24 inch monitor, but it'll only take you two to three business days to get the 27 inch monitor. And so this might impact someone's decision making because they want something sooner and they would then go for the larger monitor. Demand planning is a comprehensive collaborative process that requires consensus or agreement by all departments involved. Companies need a common demand plan so that they can work jointly together to achieve their agreed upon goals. Collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishing, or CPFR, is the process of sharing visibility, information, and resources that facilitates planning to satisfy customer demands. CPFR seeks cooperative management of inventory through joint visibility and replenishment of products throughout the supply chain. So again, think about all the different players involved within the supply chain. They have to work cooperatively together to understand what's happening with inventory so that they can plan accordingly. The following are a few key terms you'll hear often when it comes to demand plans. Now in supply chain, they love their acronyms. So these are also common acronyms that you will see or hear about. Materials Requirements Plan or MRP. Master Production Schedule, or MPS, and Enterprise Resource Planning, or ERP. The CPFR process is driven by a demand forecast. And this forecast comes from historical sales data, past information, as well as other business intelligence provided by sales, marketing, and business management personnel. These inputs come from the Sales and Operations Planning Process, or SNOP. This allows us to create that forecast or estimate of future demand. We then take that demand forecast and collaboratively work with the other business functions to create the most accurate and reliable demand plan as possible. This will give us levels of detail by factoring in the demand forecast, as well as matching it with items that we need to procure or buy from suppliers and from our manufacturing capacities and capabilities. The outputs that come from the demand plan are the MRP and our MPS. The material requirements plan lets us know what to buy from suppliers, while the master production schedule lets us know what to make and when to make them. Now each of these outputs goes to a particular function or department, such as the MRP goes to the procurement department and they are responsible for buying the materials needed from suppliers. And then the MPS will go to the manufacturing group so they can go ahead and start making what it is we need. Now with all of these components floating around, it's helpful for companies to have something known as the ERP software or system that captures all of these components in one place. Enterprise resource planning software combines multiple business functions, the material requirements planning, the distribution requirements planning, and the capacity requirements planning, and merges all of these planning systems into one. By putting all these components together in one system, it makes it easier for us to balance supply and demand because all of the information is in one place. Now, unfortunately, not all companies have an ERP system because they can be quite expensive and complex to implement. Let's dive a bit deeper into the kinds of demand forecasting companies use. There are two primary kinds. There's quantitative forecasting and qualitative forecasting. 
So how I like to remember is if we break down the first part of quantitative, think quantity. And the quantity of something has to do with numbers. So when doing quantitative forecasting, this is where companies take historical data that they have in their systems. And this allows them to calculate the future demand or forecast based on those numbers. Qualitative forecasting, again, if we think about the first part of the word quality, this is when we have little to no past data to work with and instead we're going to use intuition or expert judgment. Whether you're using quantitative or qualitative, both methods need us to understand the events and conditions that can affect demand. Examples of some of the external inputs might be the customers we have, who are our competitors, and what does the industry look like in the current economy. Uh, in regards to internal inputs, these are things like pricing, special promotions, or new product launches that we might be having. So the more information you have about these inputs will help us develop a better forecast. Whether you use quantitative or qualitative methods or both, a model of the demand pattern is determined. A trend demand pattern means that there's predictable growth or decline occurring. So you can see here is the visual for trend. Demand here is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. And so we can see that there is a trend of growth occurring for this good or service. With a seasonal demand pattern, we see patterns of increase and decline that repeat cycle after cycle. So again, we still have the demand and time here on our axes, but with the seasonal, you can see it goes up and down after each cycle. With cyclical demand patterns, these are patterns that are influenced by external factors, such as a recession or recovery. And then the demand pattern known as trend with seasonality is where we see predictable growth or decline based on cycles. So you can see it's kind of a combination of the trend and the seasonal in that we see the up and down, but the trend overall uh, in this visual is an upward trend or a growth trend. In addition to these four, you could also have stationary, which means our demand is pretty steady or even. And you can also have random, meaning the changes and variances are not predictable. They're just all over the place. By knowing or understanding these demand patterns, we can now make better decisions as it relates to our demand plans and forecasts. Demand planning has many challenges. Forecasting is almost never perfect. We don't have a crystal ball or fortune teller that's going to tell us exactly what's going to happen in the future. Now, one of the main challenges that we experience is that we might not have customer demand data early enough in order to create accurate demand planning. Another challenge is figuring out the demand for new products, which requires a highly coordinated effort by multiple departments like sales, finance, research and development, engineering, and marketing. Since we know forecasting is almost never perfect, when we create these plans, we should allow for some potential inaccuracies. So give a little wiggle room in those plans, knowing that things might change. Companies create forecasts at different time lengths. It could be long range or short term. And keep in mind that long range forecasts tend to have a greater degree of error because there is more risk of fluctuations or changes that can um, create risk within that plan. Whereas short term forecasts are less uncertain because we have known market conditions or defined customers or information that's applicable for that shorter time period. The bullwhip effect is a supply chain phenomenon related to inaccurate forecasts that create disruption and expense for a company and has a ripple effect from customers to suppliers. It ultimately reduces profit and inflates the end cost for customers. Now, variations in demand are amplified for a variety of reasons, such as, as I mentioned, inaccurate forecasting or planning, poor communication, poor visibility into our information, long lead times, or late deliveries. Here's a quick visual of the bullwhip effect in that small changes in demand 
can produce a whip-like effect. So you can see here's the whip that is affecting the retailers, manufacturers, and suppliers. Just because the customers here had some small changes in the demand that they had for a particular good or service. Um, an example of when the pandemic first started, customers suddenly wanted to buy toilet paper. This impacted retailers because they had empty shelves and they needed to buy more to meet that demand, which in turn informed the manufacturers and suppliers that there's been a sudden shift in the demand for toilet paper. Let's talk about two types of demand, independent demand and dependent demand. So here we've got an example of a bicycle. Independent demand is demand for a finished product, in this case, a bike. This is demand outside the company and it's created by our customers. Independent demand creates a demand for finished goods like bikes to be made or manufactured. Dependent demand is a demand for a good or service that is related to or occurs as a result of a demand for another. So think components. As the independent demand for bicycles go up, the dependent demand for components like tires and bicycle seats would also occur. So understanding your independent demand will help you make better decisions on dependent demand as well. Some friendly reminders, make sure to take the weekly quiz before coming to class. Note you do get two tries with the best score saved. So take it once before for coming to class to check your learning and bring any questions that you might have from the quiz. And then you can take your second try if you need to um, by the end of the week. Make sure to submit this week's Cornell notes by Sunday. And again, your notes should cover the readings, the videos, and any in-class discussions. And then if you're interested in extra practice and in turn extra credit on this week's concepts, you can check out the Quizlet link in Canvas.